we come to the end, it seems like, for three months, we've been talking about Psalms chapter 23. And so many times people, again, when they look at Psalms 23, they, they don't really truly understand everything that's in there. And so today we come to the conclusion of Psalms 23. And when you look at Psalms 23, you actually can divide it up into 12 things that God said that he will give to us. And so we've already talked about the 11th, and now we come to the climax of everything in what he's giving to us in, in point number 12. And we've already read it, but they'll have the stuff on the screens. So they'll follow with me. You can follow along with them. Uh, we had to work on these so that you could actually see them. I think they're bright enough that everybody can see them now. And, and so just kind of follow along with us as we have different versions of the Bible and the scriptures that are there. He says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And then it has this little connector in there. It, it doesn't just finish with that, you know, that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's the first part. And then here comes the kicker to the end of it all when he says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And when we begin to go through all of the things that God's going to do, you know, we started out, he said that he will help you rest when you're stressed out. He's going to help you when, he's walk, when you walk through the valley of the shadow. Excuse me, of the shadow of death. He said he also, David said, he said he will also anoint your head with oil. And when you need healing, he says that your cup will overflow. And when we begin to look at all of these metaphors and how God is so good in our life, then at the end, he says, no, by the way, that's not the end of it. There's more to come. And I need to talk to you about that this morning, is what he's saying. And that is this. He says, you're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you ever watch these game shows? And even some of these talk shows, they'll, um, they'll look to the crowd and they'll say, you have just won a year's supply of something. And they all just go, woo, yay, I just want a year of something. And you come to find out that nobody in your family likes it. And it's like, okay, so now what am I going to do with this year of, of, of oysters or whatever, you know, that you don't like? And, and so what David is saying is this is like in a comparison to this game show, but the difference is it's not just a year's supply of something you don't like. It says you're going to be or dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And may I say this to you? You're not going to complain. When God fixes a meal, I don't think anybody's going to say, uh, God, I don't think I like that. Uh, could I have something else to eat, you know? Because when I was down there on earth, I know you made all of this stuff and we were supposed to eat it, but it tasted terrible. And I ate it only because my mom made me eat it. And once I got into my own house and my own life, Never again did I ever eat soup beans and cornbread. I know. Huh? huh? Yeah. So if my wife would like you to invite, anytime you fix cornbread and soup beans, invite her to your house, okay? And then I'll stay home and, and drink my Coke and eat my Reese cups, Okay. <laughs> And so we'll, we'll just kind of eat like that. But what we want to do is, is talk about heaven. And, and so in here, there's really kind of like a question. And when we talk about it, we, ask, we really ask ourselves a question. What is heaven? We, we got all these ideas of what heaven's going to be like and, and all of these dreams of, of what we think are going to be like that. And what I want to do is take you through some scriptures to help define maybe and give you a clearer picture of what heaven's going to be like this morning. 
when we start out, we start out in, in what is heaven. It's on your screen. If you picked up an outline, you'll find it there. And it's found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. And here's what he says. It is through grace that we have been saved. And God has given us a place with Christ in heaven. Now, when we begin to look at all of this, we ask ourselves, well, why has God given us a place with Christ in heaven? Why is he saying that he wants us in this family and we're going to live with him forever? And we're asking these questions, why do you want this? And here's what he says. He finishes it up with the last part of the verse. He says what? To show for all the ages to come God's goodness to us because of Christ. To show for all the ages. So guess what? When we get to heaven, the show starts. And what the show is going to be on display is for everyone that was, that was not part of this knowing Christ as their Savior because there's still a lot of God's creation that's still out there. He's not undoing it. It's still there. The only thing he's undoing is the earth. A new heaven and a new earth. All of the rest of the creation is going to stay. The moon will still be there. Mars, Jupiter, um, Uranus, Saturn, Pluto, Mercury, Venus, and whatever else I forgot, okay, out of the nine. Or I'm sorry, there's only eight planets now because they, Pluto, they, this, they said that's no longer a planet. Whatever. You, you know, try to re, reteach me old things. I don't think so. It, I've always called it a planet. It will always be a planet. Okay? It's just the way it is. But what's going to happen? All of God's creation that's out there is going to see us through the eyes of God's goodness. In his grace. The Bible says that the sun and the moon shall, shall refuse to shine. But look at what he says. He just doesn't say that I'm going to help you while you're down here on this earth. He says, I'm going to give you strength when you're weak. I'm going to give you provisions when you lack something. I'll help you when you're in need, when you're scared. I'll be with you. But in, in addition to all of those things in this life, he says, I want you to know that I want you to live with me forever. That to me is awesome. That God, the creator of all things, wants me to live with him. Knowing me, knowing all of my failures, knowing everything that I've ever done, God still wants me to live with him forever. And may I say this to you, not only does he want me, he wants all of you. The Bible says that God sent his son to redeem the whole world, not just part of it. God's plan from the very beginning, ladies and gentlemen, was this. Every child that was born and every child that wasn't born, okay? Somebody asked me one time, what happens to a child who doesn't come into this world? I believe the Bible says that, um, and, and I'll go back to a story, that we're coming into Christmas, and at this point in time, Jesus was conceived into the womb of Mary by the seed of God, the Holy Spirit, and Mary's egg that was fertilized by God's Spirit. She had a cousin by the name of Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was already six months pregnant. And Mary, Joseph, sent her, and she went over there, and when she came into the presence of Elizabeth, John the Baptist hadn't been delivered yet. He was still in the womb. When he came into the presence of Mary, 
who at that point in time, Jesus was just very small. He probably did not have eyes and ears and hands and feet and all of those things yet. They hadn't been created. The Bible says that when this happened, that John, who was in the belly of, the, of his mother, Elizabeth, just leaped. Why? Because he knew he was in the presence of the Messiah, that later on in life, he was going to go around this earth and in the presence of everybody else, proclaiming, behold, the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God. And the thing about it, he knew Jesus before he was even born, ladies and gentlemen. Don't tell me if he died, where was he going? I know where he was going. And that's why I keep trying to tell people. Some people say, you know, I, 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 I've, I've only, my, my child, you know, a stillbirth or whatever. May I say to you, God had a plan for that life. That child will, will meet you, will greet you or whatever. They're waiting too. The only difference is they got there without having to travel through this mess. And somebody says, does God love them that much? Absolutely. He does. And this is, this is just, that's not in here, but that's here. It's just wherever. <laughs> it's just, I got my notes, and God, you leave me wherever you want me to go. But look, what did God say? He says, he says to show for the ages to come God's goodness to us. Listen, God's goodness is not just dated. God's goodness is not just for right now in your life. God's goodness, ladies and gentlemen, was here before you came it will be here while you're going through here. And if Jesus doesn't come back, may I say this to you, and we all have died, and there's still people that have come on, God's goodness is still going to go on. We look at the world, and, and we look at this nation, and it's, it's in chaos. But let me say this. In the middle of all of this chaos, God is still good and has never stopped being good. So when we look at, when we look at heaven... We need to look at some things that, that are going on, and, and that is, this is, a, it, this is an imperfect world. Get, get that, please. God didn't create it this way. This isn't God's fault. This is our fault. And if it gets worse, it's not God's fault. It's our fault because he's given us a freedom to choose. And he's also telling us that from our choices, there are consequences. And sometimes people think, no, I can just do whatever I want and get by with it. You may get by with it here in this world, but you ain't getting by with it. Because one day, you will be found out. And God will let you know. So, let's talk about heaven. Some people believe that heaven is just a state of being. Let me say this to you. Heaven is a physical place, not some fictional place that we just look at in our mind, okay? It's not a dream. It's not something that, that we're, somebody just thought of one day because John chapter 14 in verses number two and verses number three, look at what it says. There are many rooms in my father's house or home, okay? And when you look at this, this word father's home is, is just one of, the, one of the terms that is found in the Bible to describe heaven. Somebody says, where's heaven? That's, where God, that's God's home. Where's it at? I have no clue. It can be wherever God wants it to be. Why? Because he owns it all. So where is God's home? It's everywhere because that's where he's at, okay? In heaven, it's also called paradise. It's also called the kingdom of heaven. And there's many terms in the Bible to, to describe that. But look what he said. There are many rooms in my father's home, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Did you ever get a call from somebody? And they said, by the way, 
we're going to come visit you in in, uh, the second week of December. You know they're coming. What do you do? I, I call Megan and ask her, hey, you got a hotel room <laughs> that, I can, that I can put my family up in? No. What you do is you start looking around your house and you start preparing a place for them to come and, when they're with you, to stay with you. And that is their spot for the whole time that they're there, right? You also have your kitchen area. And you tell them, okay, this is, where, this is your room, this is your, where you can stay, but we've got all of this other spaces in our house. We've got bathrooms, we've got laundry rooms, we, we, we've got a basement, we've got TVs, we, we've got a kitchen area, we've got a place to eat, there's a, there's a living room, whatever. And what do we do? We share everything that we have in, that, in what we call our home with our guest, Right? That, ladies and gentlemen, is God. God has prepared this home. And he's got all, this, all of this stuff in his home. And when he says, okay, I've got a room for you that Jesus prepared specifically for you. And I don't know about you, but when I think about Jesus preparing something for me, I think it's going to be the best. Okay? It will probably be the only 10-star hotel that's out of this world, literally, out of this world. And I don't think you're going to have to complain about the maid service. I don't think you're going to have to worry about picking up your clothes because you're going to have a white robe that will never get blemished. You're not going to have to worry about anything because God has got everything already prepared for you, waiting for you. And so he says, here it is. When he talked to his disciples, and, and after he died on the cross, and they've become re- resurrected, resurrected, right before he went back to heaven, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he finishes up and he says this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you this if it wasn't true. And when your place is ready, I'll come back to get you so that you'll always be with me and live where I live. So, I don't know when Jesus is going to say, Chuck, it's time to check in. But I know one thing, Jesus right now is preparing a place for me in the house of his father, in his home. And he's saying, when it's all finished and everything's ready, He's going to say, okay, Chuck, it's time to come on, check in. And I'm not going to say, hey, can I delay this check in? (laughs) Can I have delayed check in, you know? He's going to say, no, you don't understand, Chuck. Check in is 12 o'clock, and you've got to show up. And let me say this to you, I am not going to complain. I'm going to show up, and Jesus is going to show me my room. I got this place prepared for you. He's He's been kept busy. Did I say this to you? God has not stopped, and he's still doing these things. So it's not a physical place. Number two, or let me say this. If heaven is not true, then Jesus is a liar. May I say this to you? I have not found any place yet that you can contradict what Jesus has said or what God had written, okay? Number two, it's a permanent place that will last forever. Look, our homes down here eventually will fall apart, okay? Some homes that were built in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 50s, some of them have already, have already fallen down. We lived in a house um, before our house here. We lived in that house, and the best we can figure is that house was originally built in 1803 when Ohio became a state. That house was built. And you want to know what? That house was still standing. 
You want to know why? It had three layers of brick. That was the walls. It wasn't two by four studs with, with some siding on, on or some barrier and then a row of bricks. It was three rows of brick. So when it was summertime, those bricks got hot. Guess what happened in that house? It got hot. And in the winter, when those bricks got cold, guess what? It got cold. That place had three fireplaces. Only one of them worked. <laughs> the, other, the other two were boarded up. But we found out that, yeah, they were boarded up, but they had visitors in them. They were called bats, okay? And you would sit there at night and watch them just coming out of the chimney, you know? And, and, and then in the morning, you'd get up, and you'd watch them coming back, you know? And then every once in a while, a little baby lost its way, and it would find its way into your house. And that's, after a while, it was like, okay, we're done. We're out of here. You can have the house. It's yours. But look at what he says, okay? In, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1, here's what he said. It will be a home in heaven that will last forever. Nobody's going to come in later on and say, I'm sorry, but we're going to bulldoze your house that Jesus built for you. Nobody's going to come in and say, I'm sorry, but mortgage is due and you're behind on the payment. Because let me tell you something. When Jesus gave you the house, ladies and gentlemen, it is free and clear. Nobody owns the mortgage because Jesus paid the price for it. When he said to tell us die on, on the cross, which meant paid in full. Whatever, it's, whatever is charged to your account, I covered it. I covered it every bit. Not only that, he says this in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 10 says this. This is God's purpose, that when the time is right, when the time is right, he will gather his children together from wherever we are to be with him in Christ forever. This is going to be awesome. So, um, you're from Nigeria, which is in Africa, for those of you that don't know that, okay? Okay, that's Nigeria. Um, you all are from, from where? My, my grandson? Microne Micronesia. Micronesia Pompeii? Okay. So you're all from the same place, right? Okay. I'll pray for you. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Okay. So you're from one part of the world, right? From the eastern part of the world. You're from more or less the middle part of the world. And we're from the western part of the world. And the awesome part about this is that when God says it is time, what's going to happen is this. The western part of the world, the northern part of the world, the central part, southern part of the world, the middle part of the world, and the eastern part of the world, guess what's going to happen? we all going to meet together. Every one of us are going to meet together, and there is going to be a blending like never, ever before. You talk about a multicultural, multinational gathering, and the greatest part about it is this, there will be no language barrier. Every one of us are going to be saying the same thing in whatever language we know, and it's going to be, Woo! hallelujah, praise the Lord as we're going up. It isn't going to be like, hey, it's nice to meet you guys. I like you. You're really, really, really neat. It's going to be, Woo! Yo! go, go. We're going to be like Sunday morning when the Bengals are finally winning. We're going to, that's what heaven's going to be like. <laughs> when, God takes, when God takes a bunch of losers that the whole world thinks is a bunch of losers as Christians, and you all as losers didn't get to enjoy anything on this earth, we're going to say, hey, hang on, bro. You want to see what winners are? We're winners. 
We're not losers. We're winners. We may have gave up some stuff on this world in order to become a winner, but let me tell you something. The trophies that we get are going to be awesome. And, and the other part is they're going to be jealous forever because based on Scripture, I'm sorry, but those who don't know Christ are going to get a glimpse of what's happening with us because I saw it with the, with the uh, rich man and Lazarus in the Scriptures. He looked up and he saw Lazarus and saw the joy that Lazarus was having. And he, he, he basically was jealous of what was going on. Okay, so here we go. It's a permanent place that will last forever. We talked about that. That this is God's, uh, Ephesians 1.10, I think, is that when his time is right, he will gather his children together from wherever we are to, to live with him forever. Number three, or, or the third part of that, it is a reserved place for only God's family, okay? So let me say this to you. There's been a lot of awful people in this world. You, you have people like uh, um, Pol Pot. You had Stalin. You, you have Mao who killed millions and millions of people, okay? And so when you think about it, If, if these people who did all of these things could go to heaven, what would make it so special? But it's not. Now, if, if, if they accepted Christ, yes, they'll go. But when you begin to look at it, you begin to understand that I don't think they did, okay? So look at this. In the book of Revelation... Chapter 21 and verse number 27, it says this, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be able to enter. Talking about heaven, your name has got to be on the registry. If it's not on the registry, ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna, there's, there's gonna, there might be a lot of people that get there, and what are they going to say? Hold on a minute. Check it again. God says, I don't need to check it. I wrote it. I know who's there. Well, no, no, no. It's got to be some mistake. You don't understand. I did this and, 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 and this or that, and, and, I, and I stayed in church, and I did all the, these things. He said, hold on a minute. That was great. You stayed in church. You did all of these things, but you didn't do the first thing that you needed to do, and that was you didn't give your life to me, you didn't accept my son and his sacrifice on the cross. You thought that you attending church, you doing all of these good things, that's what's going to get you to heaven. And he says, you don't understand. That doesn't work. Because nothing that you and I can do can ever pay the price that, that God has predetermined. The price for your sins is something you can't pay. Jeff Bezos may be the richest man in the world, and, even, and he, may, he may go into space, he may go everywhere, he may do all these things and, and do great things for people. But if Jeff Bezos doesn't know Christ as his Lord and Savior, Jeff Bezos' money is not following him where he's going. It's going to stop here. And when Jeff Bezos goes to hell, the money doesn't go there. Somebody's going to be rich eventually. Not really. They're all going to be poor because it's all going to be gone. Okay? So when you look at this and you say, okay, so how do I, how do I get my, my name in the, in the book of life? And, and Jesus says this, I am the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so if I want, my, if I want to get in, then my name is going to be in the book of life because I've accepted Christ, okay, when we go that. Now, I hear all the time, and let's just get this straight out. I'll talk to people, and I'll share with them Christ, and I'll, and I'll come to a point in there, and I'll say, okay, listen, you got to understand something. There's only 
After this life, there is only two destinations, heaven or hell. And, and they'll say, well, hold on a minute. What, what's hell like? And I'll begin to explain to them, hell is pain. You, you think you suffer here? Let me ask you a question. Is there certain things in your life that you would like to forget? Right? May I share this with you? In hell, you won't. In hell, everything, everything that you've ever done, it's going to be there. You may have thought you forgot it. I was, um, how old was I? I think I was about maybe 11, 12 years of age. And we were out playing in the alley, which we always played in. And there were two little, there was a little boy, little girl that were playing. And the house that they lived in was one of those houses that was built out of wood. And it was, it was a, it was a, a duplex. But in this point of being a duplex, there was a, a, the house downstairs, and then there was a stairway that you would come into from the outside to go up to the upper apartment, okay? Well, when you walked into the landing there, this was wood. This wood had begun to start pulling apart, okay? Underneath there was the basement. In the basement was the water tank, hot water heater, uh, furnace, and all of that stuff. These two little kids, somebody had been out mowing the grass. And they had taken the, the gas can and had left it sit there. These two little kids were playing with it. And we went over and said, you need to stop. Where's your parents? Well, they're upstairs. Okay, so we tried to get in touch with them, and we couldn't. We walked away, and the little boy hit the gas can, and it spilled. It went down, and the next thing you know, the house is on fire. Okay? We're there. The house is on fire. The grandmother comes flying out the window onto the roof out of the upstairs apartment. The flames are shooting up the stairway. Okay? The little boy had gone over to the right hand side. The grandmother. And, and the little girl and the mother was over on the left-hand side. And they had gotten out by going through that window onto the porch and stuff. But the little boy didn't. You could hear the screams. And I don't know if you've ever been around a place where the screams of just saving me, save me, save me, save me. Please, someone save me. Please, someone save me. Makes an impression on an 11-year-old little boy. But it made a bigger impression because that's what hell's going to be like. And the anguish and the pain that you've seen with that mother wanting to save that child and couldn't. And that child screaming, someone help me, someone help me, someone help me. That, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be what hell's going to be like. Because nobody's going to be able to save them. And it isn't stopping. And that's why when you talk with people, people will say, how can a loving God send people to hell? And I tell them, you don't understand. God doesn't send us to hell. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that hell was only prepared for Satan and his angels. It was only big enough to contain them, 
The one-third of the angels that fell, that's how, that's how big heaven was or hell was. Hell, every time a sinner, sinner dies and goes to hell, hell has to expand to accommodate them. Heaven, ladies and gentlemen, was built so big, so large, that God knew exactly how many people were going to be born between that time and, and, and the end, and he built it big enough that it would contain all of us. And the problem is that hell is going to be crowded where heaven is going to be em- not, not empty, but you're going to have a lot of freedom to move around. And the problem is God doesn't send them there. They chose. We choose. And sometimes we need to make people understand these things that we do choose. And and in Luke chapter 10, verse number 20, he's telling the people there that you're celebrating, and here's what he said, instead you should rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. The moment the moment that you step across the line that says, God, I accept, your, I accept your son, Jesus, at that moment, ladies and gentlemen, we've scored. And nobody can ever take that back from you. You scored. It's yours. And it's there. So how is heaven different from earth? Okay? In Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9, it says this, No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no mind has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You can think of the coolest thing in your mind about what you think heaven's going to be like, and you ain't even going to hit it. Even in your wildest dreams and your imagination, you can't even come up with what heaven's going to be like. It is beyond our imagination. And we come up with some Really far out stuff sometimes. I don't know about you, but I've gone back and watched shows like, do you ever watch, do you ever watch Gilligan's Island? Okay, what? Huh? Okay. Have you ever watched Gilligan's Island? Have you ever watched some of these old westerns? Okay. Watch some of the newer movies. Watch one of the old movies, and then watch one of the new movies. And I sit there and I think, that is the cheesiest set I've ever seen. You can tell that all of those trees are fake. Those, how, those, those buildings, they're, they're just a facade. There's nothing to them. And then you look at the, the new movies, and man, it's so animated, it's just crazy. Uh, what's this? What's this new show? Uh, it's called the Avatar. Is it called the Avatar? What, huh? What? What is it? Alter ego, and and you've got these people backstage singing, and they've got this avatar out there on stage, and they're back in the back singing, and while they're back there singing and with the movements. This thing on stage is moving, and they're controlling it. And you're thinking, wow, I wish you would let me do that to my wife. (laughs) I'm only kidding. (laughs) I, I would never do anything like that, okay? God wouldn't let me. But look. (laughs) <laughs> I, I got to go on. I'm already in trouble. Whew, man, I'm getting embarrassed. <laughs> look, look at what he says. In, in Revelation chapter 21, he says, there's no temple there. Why? Because God's already there. We don't need a temple. Because God's presence is going to be everywhere. The Bible also says there's going to be no sun, no moon in heaven. He says, why? Because God's glory shines bright and lights up everything. He says there's no shut gates in heaven. Why? There's no crime. There's no need to lock everybody up in heaven. Guess what? We get to go wherever. It is awesome. Remember growing up where you wanted to go somewhere and your mom and dad told you no? And then remember... When, when they would let you go, they would tell you, they would say, you got to be back before this time. The awesome thing about heaven is this. 
You can go anywhere you want to go, and there is no curfew. So guess what? I can come to your house, and we can party. And some people say, you're going to party in heaven? Absolutely. God's preparing feast for us and everything. I don't know about y'all, but it's going to be better than any fast food place you've ever been. He's gonna, God's catering it, and we're going to go over there and enjoy, and nobody's going to tell me that i got to be back home by such and such a time. You talk about freedom, this is awesome. Just to think of some of the things. He says, there's nothing impure, unclean in heaven. Everything's pure. Remember, they're talking about we've messed up the environment and they're doing all these new green deals where we're going to have pure air and pure water. May I tell you this? God's already did the clean, he's already done the clean, green, clean air act. It's called heaven. Because up in heaven, it is going to be pure water. There is not going to be any contamination. You can go to the river or to the creek or to the banks or whatever it is that's flowing through there, and guess what? You don't have to worry about drinking out of that water or worrying about who drank in front of me, <laughs> you know? And ain't going to be worried about that. And, and then it, it's like the air, it, it's like, this is what clean air is like? And you know the awesome thing about it is it doesn't cost us $3.5 trillion. Yes, absolutely no budget. (laughs) God's got it covered, every bit of it, okay? So when we look at all of these things, we need to understand this. There are some things that says that there's going to be no deceit in heaven. Only people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We already talked about that. But in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 4, there's something that, to me, is absolutely awesome. And here's what it says. It says that there's some things that are not going to be in heaven. God will wipe away all tears from your eyes. Number one, there will be no pain and suffering for those that struggle with cancer. For those that that struggle with lupus and and, and Alzheimer's, for those that struggle with arthritis, for those that struggle with a disease their whole life, guess what? Not in heaven. Not in heaven. Not on God's watch. He'll wipe away all tears. Look at the other thing. There shall be no more death. The hardest thing, the hardest thing in this life is to give up somebody that you love. But you know what heaven's going to be like? There is no giving up of anybody that we love. They're there, and they're staying. We won't have to say goodbye. He says there will be no more death. Look at this. There will be no more sorrow. I don't know about y'all. But I look, and, and, and I'm not going to finish with this, this part again. We're going to have to continue to next week. I look around me, and, and I see so much hurt, and I see so much pain. I, I see people struggling day to day just, just to live. You, you know, you, you look on social media, and Somebody's struggling. They, they, they don't have food. And somebody will say, well, why don't you go get a job? And they'll say, well, you don't understand. I, I don't have a car. Well, you got this. Or why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? And, and, and what happens a lot of times is they begin to start criticizing. And a lot of times they don't understand. They're not that person. And that person's struggling just, just for food. Or, may I say this to you, go to the other side of Middletown, over by the bridge, and walk down that street and see the homeless people that are living there in the tents. A few months ago, 
there was two women who had came from, I, I believe, up around Oxford Riley, Middletown, with two children. They were living in a tent. And those two women killed those two children. Those kids didn't deserve to die. They deserved to live. Somebody took their life. You read in the newspaper, husband and wife who's been married 60, 70 years. They're 80, 90 years old now. Their health is slowly fading from them. They got the news that the wife or the husband has got cancer or something incurable. They go to the doctor and the doctor says, I'm sorry, but there's nothing we can do for you because you're over 80. We can't do this operation. We can't give you this treatment because it's too expensive. And you're not going to live long anyway. They go home from the doctor's appointment and they're standing there together going over what's happening, realizing that one of them is going to be leaving soon and the other one is already beginning to feel the hurt and the pain and the loneliness of losing someone that they've been with for 60 to 70 years and thinking, I can't go on. And the pain that they're feeling. And someone gets a call that there's been a murder-suicide. And somebody says, how could someone do that? How could someone do that? They're hurting. And the one that they love so much is hurting. And they want to just get them out of that pain. And at the same time, they don't want to experience life without them. And yet so many times we'll judge them. We have no right to because we don't know them. We don't know what they're going through. We don't know what they're feeling. But God says in heaven, that ain't going to happen. It won't be there. When I see these things, I hurt. Hurt. He also says there's going to be no more tears. No more tears. And I want you to understand something when he says no more tears. I hear people say, does that mean there's no crying? No, we're going to cry, I believe. We will cry. But not tears of pain, but tears of joy. Have you ever had something happen to you that just so overwhelmed? And, and someone went to ask you, what happened? And, and, and you are so excited. And, and the eyes just start to tear up. And they just start running down. And someone says, what's wrong with you? Are you, are you sad? No, I'm not sad. I'm not sad at all. I'm happy. I don't know about you all. Absolutely. I believe with all of my heart, that when I get to heaven, I will go to this position, to my knees. And I believe the tears will start to flow. And I believe that I will praise my almighty Jesus. How long will I stay there? I don't know, because guess what? The knees aren't going to hurt anymore. They won't give out. I could be there for a million years and still not even know that I was there. There is no time limit. So many times we think, oh, well, I'm just going to bow before him and get up and go see this stuff. I don't think so. I I think we're going to have a a, a nice little bow down, let's come into Jesus party when we finally get to see him face to face to understand how much someone loved me that a lot of this world really doesn't care for, 
But someone loved me so much that he was willing to give his life for me. I'll answer that later. Give me next week, and I'll answer your question. Because here's the deal. And let me be plain as I can say. Jesus Christ came from heaven, gave up his position and authority to this earth to live like you and me so that when I talk to God through the Holy Spirit's direction, through Jesus Christ as my intercessor, God knows exactly what I'm feeling. Because the Bible says that Jesus has experienced everything that you and I have experienced, yet he did not sin. So he knows, ladies and gentlemen, he knows how hard and how difficult it is that you're going through right now and trying to stay true to Christ or to God. He knows how much it's, that strength takes. Because, ladies and gentlemen, he had to sleep. He had to re-energize. Even though he was God, he was God in the flesh, and he felt what we feel. So he understands. And so what do we see? I see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me and, and, and for you. He's saying, God, don't give up on him yet. Give him another chance. Give him. God says, what should I do? And, he's, and Jesus says, send the Holy Spirit tugging on them. Send them to Calvary Baptist Church on November the 7th at, at 1030. Send them there so they'll hear a message that says, you choose your destiny. Jesus said, or Joshua said, I believe it was, said, stands before you today with two choices, God or Satan. And Joshua said this, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My question today is this, are you serving him? Do you know Jesus? Jesus.